Okay, while we're getting folks in from the waiting room, I thought I'd remind everybody, if you want participation points or a certificate of completion for today, just send me an email to verify your participation and I'll get that taken care of. Um, didn't set up today's meeting with everyone on mute, so just wanted to warn everybody when you log in, you might need to mute yourselves. Um, but we do have nine o'clock on, on both of the clocks now, so I think I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining us for session 12. So this morning's agenda, we'll do our mindfulness moment and then I'll introduce the guest presenters like always. Our first guest presenter is Scott Iyer and he will be presenting on the trauma stewardship, an everyday guide to caring for self while caring for others. After we hear from Scott, we'll hear from Dustin Jansen and Dr. Harold Foster and we'll be sharing information on American Indian students and resources for them. Okay, getting some folks in here from the waiting room. Okay, so this morning's mindfulness moment um, is probably one of my favorites so far. Those who know me know I'm a gardener. Uh, so today I, I found us an article which is seven ways gardening is an exercise in mindfulness and I can tell you this works for me. Okay, so this article was written by Martha Brett Schneider and published in Women's Health in May of 2020. Um, Martha says, whether or not we have a garden of our own, something in our DNA draws us to flowers. The connection goes beyond appreciating the surface beauty of the blossom. The very act of connecting with flowers and other plants instills a sense of calm and inner peace that boosts our overall happiness levels. Science backs up the Chinese proverb that tells us if you want a happy lifetime, be a gardener. Research shows that people who spend time cultivating plants experience less stress, have a more positive outlook on life, and are happier both, or excuse me, healthier, <laughs> both physically and mentally. I guess happy works there also. Um, she goes on to say that she led a high nomadic life for the first 30 years and was a late bloomer as far as gardening, but she has found gardening to be her mindfulness mentor long before she had ever heard those terms. And I can echo those statements. When I was reading this article, I started to feel like I had written it myself. <laughs> um, anyway, so the first way that Martha shares with us is gardening grounds us in the present moment. It's the sensory experience of gardening. So it's digging in the dirt, uh, smelling the flowers, feeling the breeze on your face, and this keeps the gardener present in the moment. Uh, she says, worries about the future or past dissolve the instant we're digging in the dirt. And I don't know about the instant, but definitely does help. <laughs> I also support ripping the heads off weeds to de-stress as well. All right, let me get a few folks in here. Okay, so the second way uh, Martha uh, talks about gardening as mindfulness is she says, gardening connects us to the source of creation. By cultivating new growth and beauty in the environment and helping deliver Earth's gifts, we are acting in alignment with the future plan of the universe and the Earth rewards us for paying attention to its needs. As Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, Earth laughs in flowers. The third way she shared with us is gardening and maintaining a compost pile in particular teaches us that beauty will eventually arise from the mud. This is a good lesson to hold to your heart in the midst of dark times. You might be bogged down in a life situation that feels like a slimy mix of coffee grounds, vegetable peels, and rotting leaves. But with patience, self-reflection, and time, positive transformation occurs. The fourth way Martha shared with us is gardening teaches us how to weed out non-beneficial plants and make room for new growth of our choosing. In much the same way that mindfulness teaches us to weed out non-beneficial so thoughts, excuse me, thoughts that don't serve us, each practice supports the other, resulting in the flourishing of our internal and external gardens. The fifth way is gardening nurtures us. Oh, and I just realized I didn't move the slides. So let's do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, nurtures us is creativity. Color, texture, and form are the paintbrushes in landscape design. Uh, and gardening 
benefits us beyond flowers by engaging our senses and pulls us into creative spaces of our right brain. Uh, the sixth way is gardening teaches us to let go of our need for control. When you're a gardener, you will learn that things die. Gardeners learn to accept the impermanence with the knowledge that spring will return without fail each year. The seventh way Martha shared with us uh, is that gardening teaches us that even on the rainy days, focusing on details unveils sparkling and unexpected beauty. And as the saying goes, without rain, growth is impossible. No matter how many teachers I follow, no matter how many books I read, the garden has always offered up life's most important lessons and happiness. It has taught me patience, the need to let go of control, and the need to let go of expect expectations. Uh, the garden is a place for transformation. Most importantly, the garden has taught Martha a quiet mind is calm, content, and aware. Um, the link is in the PowerPoint, so you're welcome to read the article in full. I just tried to do a quick overview for us. Um, this after, excuse me, <laughs> our first guest presenter this morning will be Scott Iyer, and Scott works for the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health as a school-based mental health specialist, and Scott also acts as the liaison for the State Board of Education working on the Safe and Healthy Schools team. He is also a part of the Safe, excuse me, School Safety Center Leadership Team, which he works to identify evidence-based approaches that increase the physical and psychological safety of students and improve overall school climate. Scott has a passion for working with youth and spent the first decade of his career at Provo Canyon School where he helped to develop early, excuse me, the early adolescent and elementary programs there. In 2016, he began his employment with the state where he spent three years with juvenile justice services before transferring into his current position. Scott holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from U of U, excuse me, UVU, and is currently in pursuit of completing his master's degree in social work at University of Utah. In his free time, Scott enjoys being outdoors coaching his son's sports teams, building and testing paddle boards, and running slash surviving the occasional ultra marathon in the desert. Thank you for joining us this morning, Scott. After Scott, we'll be hearing from Dustin Jansen, and he is the director of Utah's Indian Affairs. Uh, Dustin is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. He's been practicing Indian law and policy since 2006. Dustin currently serves as the director, like I mentioned, of the Division of Indian Affairs and works as an assistant professor of American Indian Studies at Utah Valley University. Dustin has been married to his wife, uh, Choma, I hope I've said that right, Choma Johnson for 20 years, and Choma is enrolled with the Sioux As Asboni tribe of Fort Peck, Montana, and they have four children. Dustin, please forgive me if I did not say that right this morning and correct me when you get on to share with us. Uh, with Dustin will be Dr. Harold Foster, who has been a longtime coworker of mine, and I'm excited to hear from him this morning. Chuck was raised, excuse me, born and raised on the Navajo Reservation in Northern Arizona. He has 44 years of education experience, both as a teacher and a school administrator. He is, a for, excuse me, he is also a former collegiate athlete and a former high school cross country and track and field coach. He received his undergraduate degree from University of Arizona and doctorate degree from Brigham Young University. His doctoral dissertation entitled, The Learning Style Differences of Navajo and Caucasian Students on and near the Navajo Nation in Northern Arizona and New Mexico is used as a foundational study among many American Indian educators. Most of his professional work is associated with education to infuse native language and culture into the context of teaching and learning and the development of American Indian curriculum. He presently serves as the American Indian Education Specialist Title VI program at the Utah State Board of Education. He has four adult children and four grandchildren, and his wife, Maria, 45 years, reside in Orem. 
Chuck's father is also a Navajo code talker where most of his inspiration and desire originated to become an educator. Look forward to hearing from Chuck, like I mentioned. Okay, we won't give you that just yet. Uh, now I will stop sharing and put my brain over here to the participant. And I do see Scott has joined us. I just kept clicking the admit all button. So I wasn't sure who was here with us. Yes, I'm here, thank you. So nice to see you. So uh, I, I'm happy to turn the screen over to you. Does that work? We forgot to chat about this. Yeah, that's kind of how I think this will roll. So if that works for you. It does. I will be here on mute and then I'll keep an eye on the chat. Great. Let's see if I can get my screen working. And how's my audio? Is that is that good? It's good for me. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can share my screen. Okay. See that there are some participants. It's always nice to see people's faces. Are you guys able to see my screen or are we there yet? Okay, good, good, good. Um, in this virtual world, you never know how presentations will go. I, I'm not gonna lie, I was doing a presentation for some folks the other day and <clears throat> I was doing a great job and um, found out that my internet cut out about 10 minutes in and <laughs> everybody uh, was left uh, uh, anxiously awaiting my return. So if, if something comes up, just uh, just know that we'll work through it. Um, but I am really excited to be here. I, I think this is a great opportunity for, for professional development and me to learn from, from others. I'm really excited to present with the other folks that are here today. Um, just really quickly, if I can maybe get an idea of, of uh, the folks in the room are, can I hear from you on, on your roles with, with uh, youth? Maybe get somebody to open their mic and give me just a quick background on what you guys, what you all are doing in your work with youth. And also maybe talk to me a little bit, if you don't mind about the book that I was introduced to um, when I asked to present on trauma stewardship. Is there someone that would like to open their mic and share with me? I guess I will. <laughs> Nobody else is taking it up. Kelly will. So I'm Kelly. a mentor or Tula, uh, check and connect mentor at Tula County School District. I'm working with all the DCFS, JJS kids, and also systems of care. Um, I see a lot of kids come in with trauma or um, being displaced from homes, of course. Um, I track their attendance grades, behaviors. We talk about what they're doing in school how I can help them if I need. And I just actually got one of my kids some um, therapy. So we're doing good. That's kind of what I do. Awesome, awesome. So you guys are, are right in the thick of it. You guys are working hands-on with the, the youth. Are, have you guys, just by, I won't ask for maybe raise a hand, but maybe a head nod. Are, are you familiar with the book? Are you re, have you read the book, uh, Trauma Stewardship? I know it was, uh, this was uh, something that to me, I'm always looking for the next uh, place to increase my own knowledge. And this presentation, um, this book was thrown out there as one that some of the folks in the field were, were reading. And I actually really, really enjoyed this book. So I'll refer to it a little bit, but this is not meant to be a book report by any means. And, and I'll to um, <laughs> put you on the spot <laughs> to whether or not you read it or not. So don't, don't feel that way. But I did want to take some of those concepts in the book, some of the things that I found really valuable and do a personal and professional reflection, which is, is my goal for today's meeting. Now, um, before I really get started, I want to just kind of start with this idea of, of an ikigai. Um, an ikigai is a Japanese word that refers to purpose. It refers to why we're here, why we do the work we do. Now, everybody has their own reason of entering this work. And I want you to just maybe ask yourself why you're here, why you're doing this work. This is tough work. Um, anybody who's been around long enough to know that, um, that we have uh, oftentimes some very difficult cases that we work with, very difficult content situations. And I'd venture to guess that many folks that come into this work feel that they have 
talents um, that they're effective with the youth. Maybe, maybe you find out that you connect with these youth stories and that it's important for you to, to engage with them and, and, and work through them with them and their situations in a way that uh, maybe connects to your own lived experience. Um, I also think uh, some of us just can't turn away from the fact that there is a need. And so this, this Ikigai model, let me share with you, is this, is this concept of doing what we love, doing what we're good at, doing what the world needs, and also what we can make a living on, and applying that to our work. It's something that I use with my, it's something that I use with uh, the youth in the past to help guide them towards their purpose and their meaning. And I'm guessing that that's what brings us here today. And I think that's an important place to start because this is tough work and it's going to be hard. A lot of what we talk about today is going to be around self-care and the importance of that. I really appreciate what Amanda was sharing um, and, and, and how we start these meetings with the idea of mindfulness and, and meditation even and coming to a place of wellness personally because we can't do this work effectively without for putting ourselves first. And sometimes that's hard to hear. Sometimes it even feels selfish. But I will, I will um, as I go through the presentation, just really hit that home with you guys. I think that it's so important that we're willing to put ourselves first and that we're willing to, to do that in a way that benefits the lives of others. So I'm gonna ask you to do, two, to, to do three things today, um, if you could for me. One, whenever I run a group or a presentation, I'm gonna ask you and invite you to come all the way in and sit all the way down. And what I mean by that is we all have a lot of things going on. I get it, I, I, I understand. And for a moment, I'm hoping that we can take some time for some professional development in a way that we can increase our knowledge. If there's one or two or three things that we can take from today's time together, it would be, it would be worth your time to sit with that for a moment, come all the way in and sit all the way down with these concepts. Two, I'm gonna ask you to really try and apply this information to yourself. Um, we can oftentimes apply it towards others, the youth we serve or the families, but today let's look at ourselves. Let's look at our professional lives and personal lives. And three, anytime that we talk about trauma or anything that may be um, linked to trauma, I think it's also important that we exercise our own self-care as we talk about these subjects. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail, or I hope not to, to bring anything up that's um, triggering uh, for anybody, but it's also just important to know that anytime we, we touch on these subjects, that it can be the case. Um, let's start really quickly with just defining trauma. According to SAMHSA, trauma um, can be defined by the three E's. So an individual's trauma results from an event or series of events or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as a physical or emotionally harmful or threatening. And that has a lasting adverse effect on the individual's functioning. This could be mental, physical, social, emotional, and or spiritual well-being. So the way I tend to look at this is something that overwhelms the system. The inability to manage the weight or the gravity of a situation. And it may be because of the situation itself, or it may be because the individual doesn't have um, the foundational capacity to manage that system. So, so trauma, as defined by SAMHSA, this is where we'll that and also we'll talk a little bit about the pervasiveness of trauma sometimes we we look at trauma as something that maybe happens on occasion depend on the na the national studies that you pull from you'll find that anywhere from 55 to 90 percent of us have experienced at least one traumatic event um, i don't think that's shocking for anybody um, we know that the average aces score is just above four and a half for us, um, for those that have taken our ACEs scores, we understand what the adverse childhood experience score is and what it means. Uh, individuals report experiencing on average, here it says nearly five traumatic events in their lifetime. And the experience of trauma, it's no longer a rare exception. This, this is the rule, um, you know, no one gets through unscathed. And we all have our stories and sometimes I think 
we've um, been led to believe that trauma and its impact is is for someone else somewhere and that applies to them and i'm i'm for sure here today to push against that stigma we all have our trauma history we all have our touches with that very few people that i ever talk to or present um to um have had zero and and so it's important to know that it is pervasive and it applies to all of us so for the rest of this presentation, instead of um, me just giving you uh, <laughs> bland slides and information, I'm gonna try to frame this in a creative way that uh, helps you to remember these concepts. So we're all familiar with the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy and her lions and tigers and bears. In fact, I was thinking about just doing the whole presentation on Dorothy and her own trauma <laughs> and what she experienced in the movie. I didn't do that, but what I what I am going to do is talk about trauma, not through lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, but through cats, sparrows, and zebras. And we can still keep the oh my. So by cats, I'm gonna to point to our environment. I'm gonna look at uh, where we, we spend our time maybe. What I mean by environment is what we consume, what is around us any external stimuli, anything that's coming at us could be considered environment. By sparrows, I'm going to be looking at our internal responses, our internal process. Internal process, I'm going to refer to as thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and belief systems. And finally, with zebras, I'm going to refer to behavior. And behavior is anything that we can observe, anything that we see, uh, happening in the world around us and how we interact with the world. So I wanna start really quickly um, by, I believe I'm gonna say this, I'm probably gonna butcher this name, um, but his name is Yak Panksep, and he's an Estonian neuroscientist. He's, he's a really interesting um, researcher who became famous for his experiments with rats and how he linked that to behavior. So I want to kind of highlight his his work on one on one study where he had researchers measure and and observe playful behaviors in young rats. So these are young rats that are placed in a cage, brand new little babies, and he watches them uh, begin to interact and play. And so these rats, for the first four days, were in their cage and had a high degree of playful behavior. And what he did is he introduced one single cat hair into their environment. Now it's worth noting that the cat hair, the cat hair was new to them. They had never experienced a cat in their lives. They had never seen a cat. And it was only one single cat hair. And what he found out was that the, the playful behavior in those cats or in those mice completely, completely dropped off. The, the little rats as soon as that cat hair was in that environment, their play reduced dramatically. Now, he took the cat hair away. And after that cat hair was removed, it was maybe as shocking as the reduction in, in playful behavior is the fact that they never returned back to their normal play. That, that state of homeostasis was never, was never regained. And one of the leading theories on this study is that our environment or that these little rats, their environment was breached. The trust was breached. It was traumatic for reasons unconscious to these little rats. They had never seen a cat. Somehow they knew that that was a threat. And these little rats were aware of this violation. So the theory suggests that the environment and especially once that environment had been breached, they weren't able to regain the trust of that environment. If you're linking this in any way to your youth, you'd be correct. There's, there's that link that exists for our youth. But again, this is gonna be looking at ourselves. We're gonna, we're gonna take a look in. And so I wanna start by, um, with environment by looking at our organizational environment. What do our places of work feel like? What is it for us 
to come to work. I want to shine a light on this for a second because when we start talking about organization, we have to understand that we all play a part in this, that the culture of that organization is a dynamic between all, all folks that are interfacing with that, um, with that organization. And so it's a collective group experience. And some players um, arguably may have more power or more influence within that. We can all kind of look back and, and, and see that in our lives of maybe where we've played a role or others have played roles um, based on their position or based on their personality. But it's important for us to ask, how do our workplaces feel? Do we, do we like going to work? Do we feel good about going to work? Um, we might enjoy some things about our work, maybe, maybe some of the people we work with, maybe not so much, I don't know. Or do we dread it? Is it something that we are you know, avoiding and, and just struggle through? Uh, what do we carry with us to work? What, do we bring from our personal lives into our work in a way that becomes distracting um, or makes us less efficient or effective at what we do? So why is this important? Well, on the slide, and this comes from this, the trauma stewardship book. Um, it says that organizations themselves have the potential to either mitigate or exacerbate the efforts of trauma exposure for all their workers. The way those workers then manage trauma will in turn have an impact on the experience of the already traumatized clients. So what this says to me is that we, in approaching our work and the way that we interface with our work and the way that we promote environments of safety and the way that we promote environments that are trauma informed and ourselves, trickles down in a way that actually impacts our clients. And I think we can understand this. So my question then becomes, so how, how are you all doing with this? How does it, how does it feel um, in your work? How are your, your environments and are there places for improvement? And, and while I don't think we're gonna open the, the mic and, and have a discussion on this, I think it's important that we, we sit in the space and think about that. And maybe a, a good way to, to ask this question is, is what are the cat hairs that exist within our environments? What are the things, what are the threats that we perceive that are preventing us from being uh, able to professionally or personally um, be at our best? So safety is important. I wanna share this slide on safety. Throughout the organization, staff and the people they serve, whether they are children or adults, need to feel physically and psychologically safe, physically and psychologically safe. The physical setting is safe and the interpersonal interactions promote a sense of safety. I'm sure all of us could sit down and talk about the coworkers that they can rely on and the difference that makes in our work. The, the idea that we can lean and have these interpersonal interactions um, that really ultimately set the foundation for our work with our youth populations and with the families that we serve. How important that is to have the physical and psychological presence of safety. Using a trauma-informed approach, this means that a program or the organization or the system is trauma-informed when it realizes the widespread impact of trauma. I think we all understand that. And we also understand that there's a potential path for recovery and it recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma in, in our clients and in our families and in our staff and others involved with the system. And it responds by fully integrating this knowledge about trauma into its policies, into its procedures, into its practices, and it seeks to actively uh, resist re-traumatization. Um, <clears throat> for those, working with the JJS, JJS poppy population. I, I worked with them for three years and I helped to uh, teach uh, different, different um, trauma-informed um, principles within, within that uh, time with them. And one of the things that stood out to me was the ACEs score 
of our youth that were entering the system and the ACEs score of our youth that were exiting the system. And one thing that was apparent was that the ACEs score got higher by entering the system. By being locked up in JJS care or in incarceration in any situation is and can be traumatic and can increase and promote re-traumatization. And we need to be aware of that and we're actively work against that. Um, many of you probably see that in your own work. Adro adopt, so a key point is adopting a trauma-informed approach is not accomplished through any single particular technique or checklist. I'm not gonna give that to you in today's professional development. It will require constant attention caring awareness, sensitivity, and possibly even a cultural change at an organizational level. And again, on that organizational level, we all have a responsibility to that. So from a personal and professional environment, um, to sum that up, um, it matters. Our environments matter. Uh, we need to recognize what cat hairs exist in our organization. We need to recognize what threatens us in fully um, doing our job and ability to do our job and to take care of ourselves. Um, we need to think about how that applies to the lives of our families and how that, that will trickle down. And, and, and we have to ask ourselves, what does it feel like to, to come into and to contact with us as an organization or as a person? Um, also look at our, look at um, maybe how we're establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries in our lives. By healthy boundaries, what I'm suggesting is, is things like, are we able to keep work at work? How do you do with that? The work's difficult enough to take it home with us can be even, even more difficult. Um, as a profession, are we, uh, professionals, are we aware of where our stuff ends and where the clients begins? Sometimes that can get blurry. Again, we have our own histories and our own um, past that can sometimes influence how we interface with others. And then uh, maybe another place to look at is what are we promoting? What are we um, sharing with others? Uh, what does our workspaces feel like in, in terms of, of, of gossip, of fear, of stress, of demands? Um, Right now, because I work for the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, um, many of you are aware that there's a big merger on the state level with the Department of Health and the Department of Human Services. That in and of itself can be stressful. These aren't necessarily things that we always have control over, but we do have a responsibility to them and to asking ourselves, how are we promoting this or, or to what degree? So I wanna give you a quick skill this skill is something that you can use for yourselves. You can use this for clients. But when it comes to environment, one skill, it's very simple that I've found that is very effective. Anytime that I'm in a situation or that I found a client in a situation where we're feeling overwhelmed or we're feeling triggered or in some sort of state of crisis, the skill is very easy. It is one, we decrease stimuli. So we talk about environment as external stimuli. First skill is, or first step is to decrease stimuli. Turn the volume down, quote unquote. Um, find the place where you can uh, reduce that incoming message, whatever that may be. Again, when you're overwhelmed or in crisis. And two is to increase structure. What is structure for you? I believe that everybody thrives under structure. I think our society thrives under structure. We, we have to have some level of structure, some more than others, um, but we have to have structure. And one of the ways that we learned this was through the solid object model. The solid object model, if you haven't heard of it, it's a really, it's a great model um, to understand that when people are in crisis, when people are falling, when you are falling, it's your natural reaction to reach out, to grab hold of something or to catch yourself in your fall. And we're looking for solid objects to, to grab a hold of. In the lives of the youth that you serve, you become the solid object in those lives. You become the structure. 
the stabilization for them. And it is so important that we take a look at that and ask ourselves, how can we better promote that? And how can we better be a solid object? It's going to, it's going to take place through self-care. And uh, the first place that I'm going to suggest that you take a look at your own personal self-care is in your environment. Okay, let's transition away from the environment for a second. I want to talk about our next area, and that is the internal. And I really like this quote um, from Canadian physician Gabor Mate. If you're not familiar with him, Google him. Go find his YouTube uh, talks. He's a great uh, author and speaker. Talks a lot about childhood development and trauma, addiction, and has some really great books out there. Um, his quote um, is that it's not what happens to you externally that defines the trauma, but what happens internally to you as a result of it. So let me rephrase that maybe in a little bit different of a way. An event can be traumatic, but where the real trauma takes place is how this is internalized by a person. So we all go through traumatic experiences, but trauma takes place when it is internalized. So we're going to talk a little bit about the internal process. And by internal, again, we thought we were talking about thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and belief systems. Uh, this is unique to all of us, each one of us, based on our experience, our genetics, um, our history, background, culture, everything is different for all of us. We all look at life through a different lens. And um, I guess one way to look at this, um, ACT therapy, so acceptance commitment therapy, uh, really talks about the, the fusing with ideas, the fusing with thoughts or feelings. So a thought might be something that is maybe a, a first stage where a thought pops up. Um, cognitive behavior therapy might say that we'll challenge that thought through thinking errors and, and we'll look to disprove or mitigate that thought and that's in its influence in our lives, where ACT therapy um, tends to say it's not necessarily that the thought pops up, it's how deeply that fuses with the person. So a thought might be a surface level. Okay, a thought comes in, maybe a thought comes out. Um, but the further we go down the rabbit hole, a thought can then move innocently enough into a feeling that feeling can develop into an attitude and that attitude can eventually become a belief system, something that we fuse with very closely. So let me introduce you to the sparrows. I'm gonna hope this works. I'm gonna try and play this uh, on your screen. And I'll try to make sure there's no sound. Um, but as I'm talking about this, I, I hope that, that you can see the video. Everybody see the video? Okay. And that we can kind of pay attention to this, these birds, these sparrows. And, and start to ask ourselves, well, first of all, if you haven't gotten out to go watch the sparrows, go watch the sparrows. Um, I, I go on a trail kind of um, by my house, there's some open fields and um, it extends out to the lake. And so I get these, these sparrows that will group and they fly in formation. And they also do this really interesting thing on the ground where they all, they all go to the ground and they're in the same spot. And then on one side, uh, say that's the right side, few sparrows jump over to the left side and they're constantly rolling through the fields in a way where those that are making contact in the center can sit, can eat, can get the grubs or whatever they're looking for while the others slowly rotate through. And the reason they do this, if you guys, you, many of you probably know, but the reason why they group together, and I think it's coming up, you'll see a bigger bird kind of enter the scene. Maybe it's already passed, but these bigger birds of prey are also in the area. And when you're down in, in my neck of the woods, you'll see the owls, you'll see the, the, the red-tailed hawks, and you'll see them. And 
and come into the area and, and perch and they're watching and they're looking for those sparrows that they can pick off. But when sparrows group together, and this happens with fish as well, that, that throws off their prey, we're safer when we're connected. We feel safer. Sparrows are, are a very social creature and like sparrows, we also are, are social creatures. It's a very important need that we have to feel connected, to feel belonging, and to feel like um, to feel like we're a part of something. Um, I'm sure you feel or you're familiar with Brene Brown. I love this quote from her, and this really is where connection and trauma connect. And that is, connection is why we are here. It is what gives us purpose, meaning in our lives. And without it, there is suffering. Trauma ultimately is suffering. Um, our goal is to mitigate that suffering. We know that like these sparrows who feel safety, we too feel safer when we feel that that deep need for connection, that deep desire has been met, that we feel that there's a sense of belonging. In fact, we desire it so much so that you'll see that we'll actually seek negative attention just to fit in. Um, I mean, I'm sure you have youth that you could see this in where, 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 um, maybe, maybe negative attention is, is still attention and that fulfills their ability to get along with others and be with others. But at the same time, from an observer looking in, you know, that they're really not fitting in really well and that it's actually probably a more harmful dynamic within that relationship. This goes back to our ACEs. Aces aren't just that negative things happen. It's that negative things happen or adverse experiences happen in the absence of these key protective factors. These key protective factors, connection or feeling as though you belong as a protective factor. So, so I want you to think about that for a moment. I'm gonna to point to our SHARP survey. So, um, for those of you who don't know, we do the SHARP survey every other year. This is 2021 will be the next year that we do the SHARP survey. And um, we, we ask um, uh, students in grades six, eight, 10, and 12 to answer a set of questions. And this question is uh, an addition to the 2019 survey, which um, is asking questions around social isolation. Again, feeling feeling like you don't belong. Those four questions that they asked are right there along the bottom. And I apologize about the size, it's a little small, um, but I'll read them. And basically it asks us within the last seven days, have I felt left out? Have I felt that people barely know me? Have I felt isolated from others? Or this last one really gets me. It's have I felt that people are around me, but not with me? We know based on the responses that this is something that, uh, that our youth are feeling and, and that is taking place. And we can understand that, all of us get that on a very human fundamental level. We know what it feels like not to belong. I'm guessing that there's been at least some time in your life that, that you felt that you didn't fit in or didn't belong. Um, and the key point here is it doesn't necessarily even matter if this is true. It does not matter if it's rooted in truth or not. What matters is that the experience of the individual and how they've internalized that idea feels true to them. This is why two people can have the same exact experience and feel completely different ways. It's important that when we have these key pieces of what it means to, to develop, to engage with wor the world. Um, and when they're challenged, something as is, 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 um, important as connection and belonging is challenged. It can have a real negative impact on, on us internally and, and how, we, how we see the world. So I want you to just for a moment, pause to reflect. And again, because this is a time when you can think back and feel the times in your life where maybe you've been disconnected or not included. Um, maybe you feel that today in some ways, maybe that's happening for you now, or maybe that's something in the past, or, 
wherever that's been for you. Um, but how does this impact you when you're in that space? Again, as a personal reflection, as we go back through and we look at ourselves and how this applies to us, not to them, I'm gonna ask you to look inward for a moment. And some of us might really relate to this example of feeling like I don't belong. In fact, I'm, I'm sure that many of us have, but this is just one of a number of different examples of narratives, of storylines that we, we uh, fuse with. So I highlighted connection. I'm going to actually throw a few more out there. What I want you to do is maybe pay attention to what kind of comes up for you as I talk about this. Um, again, this isn't uh, an exercise to trigger anyone, but I, I think it's important to understand where our stuff is. So looking inward, I'm going to ask, has anybody had this narrative? I know if you're anything like me or if your voice is anything like mine, I've had this one. So pay attention to what comes up for you. I'm not good enough or I'm unworthy. I'll be left out or forgotten. Oftentimes um, this is rooted in, in, in fear of being unloved. Maybe you've had feelings of I'm worthless, the fear of low value or the perception of low value. Um, some people identify with with having no purpose. <clears throat> this is the idea that uh, who you are or who your authentic self is and you, and you struggle with that identity. And, and, and again, very common. Here's one. Um, and I have a typo here. It's not I can do it, it's I can't do it. Can't do it, I'm helpless, I'm incompetent get this a lot. Learned helplessness is something that you're going to see quite a bit um, <clears throat> the more and more you work with, with the youth. And uh, here's the one. Uh, I'll, I'll be deprived or I'll be in pain. This is rooted in neglect and also can be found in, in, in parentification rules. Youth that had to take on maybe more than they needed to, or I shouldn't even say youth, but those of us that maybe have had to take on more than we had to different times in our lives. <clears throat> They're only out for themselves. Has anybody ever felt that it's difficult to trust? Um, maybe felt being controlled by others or maybe others were out to harm you? Um, this, this is also very common and all the last couple, it will it'll be taken from me. Things Things or people are out to take things from me and don't leave me. Really a fear of loss. These folks oftentimes become, can become doormats. They can't say no, they struggle to be assertive and can uh, present itself in those ways. So I'm guessing that some of these stood out for you. I'm hoping they did. And, and that's the goal is to ask yourselves kind of where, where are my, my things in this? Where, where does it arise for me? Uh, when we know what it feels like, we can better empathize with others. I think that's a big um, piece of this, is knowing ourselves and knowing where, where, where this feels like for us can help us in, 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 in connecting with others, but also in normalizing the experience, right? I mean, saying these things, talking about these things puts us in a vulnerable space. And sometimes we feel all alone when we start talking about these things. Sometimes we feel like we're the only ones in the world that have ever felt worthless. And, and again, this is something that we know is very common and very directly tied to the trauma, to our histories, to the things that we've experienced in the past, in the past and how we've internalized different messages at different times in our lives. So my final point on this is that uh, it's not that we have had these thoughts, but it's how we've fused with them and how they continue to play out in our lives today in a way that keeps us from living a full and fulfilling life. So the skill that I'd like to introduce to you is from, is from Gabor Mate's book, 
Um, it's from when the body says no. I think it's uh, chapter four. Great book, great read. If, if you're looking for one, add it to your list. Um, and he's talking about emotional competency. And so really briefly, I'll just go over emotional competency. And I think it's easy for us in this field to see so many cases, to have so many touches with trauma that we, we start to get a little bit numb. And so the first goal of emotional competency is to keep that capacity to feel. We have to have that capacity to feel. We're not suggesting that you turn the volume down on that. You need to feel. But the second thing that you need to have is the ability to express these thoughts and feelings effectively in your work and in, in your interpersonal relationships. And then two, probably, or sorry, three, the, the one that stick, sticks out for me, and I think it's most important, is we have to have the facility to distinguish between the psychological responses that are pertinent to the current situation and that those that represent residue from the past, emotional residue. If you don't come away with anything from this presentation other than that, um, that, you know, that is to me like one of the key points. We all have emotional residue. As professionals, our job is to recognize what is coming from the past, what are we bringing to this, and what is important to the situation at hand. And being able to then use that awareness to, genu to genuinely access the needs that, re that require us to do so in the moment. If I am having an emotional reaction and it is pertinent to that situation, I need to also have the skill to act upon that in, in a way that, that allows me to still engage with the world around me. So again, emotional competency, I, there's a 10,000 brief overview, great book, and, and you'll get a lot more out of it if you actually read it, but emotional competency, great skill to, um, to strengthen. Okay. Let's move into behavior. I know we're I'm going to try and bust through this really quickly, Amanda. I know we're running a little low on time, so I'll go through quickly. Behavior isn't something someone has. Rather, it emerges from the interaction of a person's biology, their past experience, um, and the immediate context of a situation. So let's talk a little bit about zebras. Zebras. <clears throat> I'm also going to butcher this name, Robert Sapolsky. And he's a little bit more famous. Maybe some of you guys have heard his work. Uh, he's written a book on uh, why zebras don't get ulcers. And I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about zebras and type 1 and type 2 errors. So if you're a zebra, imagine you're a zebra and you're out in the savanna and there's a, a, a rustle in the bushes and you hear the grass and you believe it to be a lion and you run away. Like any good zebra, you run away and come to find out it was just the wind. You have just made a type one error. You ran away from the wind. However, if you're a zebra on the savanna and you hear the rustle in the bushes and you believe it's the wind, but it's actually a lion, you've just made a type two error. So that's the difference between a type one and a type two error. Now, zebras that make type two errors, they don't exist anymore. They get eaten very quickly. Um, evolutionary psychologists believe that we are the result of type one error folks, that our genetic past comes from our human ancestors who were literally on the savanna and ran away from all the scary things because we had to. Now running away from scary things, that sacrifices a little bit of energy. Um, we also might look a little foolish, but the end result is less negative than if we were to make a type two error and, and have much higher costs. Why is this important? Because if we only look at the behavior, if we only look at what a, a zebra is doing, what we are doing or maybe what the youth are doing, then we're missing the bigger picture. There's a bigger picture at play here. And zebras that run away have the ability, uh, unlike us, to return to good, to, to get away, to, 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 to group back up 
and begin grazing again. What's unique to humans is, is we don't forget very often. We, we remember the rustle in the bush and we worry and we ruminate about this. And this is why some of our, um, I shouldn't say some of our, but why one of our greatest uh, mental health concerns is anxiety and how we manage and, and deal with anxiety, but not necessarily anxiety. What I wanna focus on is the actual behavior. So I'm, a, I'm going to focus on behavior on this and try to um, explain it through this idea of arrows. Arrows are the traumas that come into our lives. Based on that arrow, based on that trauma, based on that thing happening to us, we interpret, again, that's the internal, but the conclusion ends up being the behavior. In context, it makes sense why a zebra runs away from everything all the time. In fact, I don't even have to be the zebra to run away. It can be my buddy, Jerry over there, and he might hear it and he perks up and says, oh my gosh, and I react to him and we both run away. We don't even have to be the ones that experience it as much as the time. The arrows in our lives can be direct or they can even be indirect. It's what we call vicarious trauma. It's what we call secondary trauma. Just having those issues in front of us can be a form of trauma, but especially when we've been impacted directly. When those arrows have hit us personally, we receive that as a message. That message then influences our behavior. So let me give you an example of this really quickly. I was working with a client <clears throat> and uh, we'll call him Tom. And when uh, Tom came to see me, he was uh, struggling with his relationships. He was having a hard time um, with a divorce situation from his past that, uh, that came up and also getting back into relationships with women. We dug into Tom, uh, Tom's history. We talked a lot and, and um, come to find out Tom, his parents were divorced at age nine. And it was ugly and dad was, and um, they didn't get along. What basically happened was on Fridays, dad would come pick up Tom. And Tom and his parents, again, ugly divorce. Fridays, dad would come pick up Tom and his little sister. But because it was such an ugly divorce, mom wouldn't allow dad to come into the house. So they went to the curb. And they sat on the curb or waited on the curb until dad arrived. Just so happened to be that Friday was also garbage day in their neighborhood. Garbage day meant everybody brought their trash out to the curb. <clears throat> and so Tom spent his Fridays, <coughs> excuse me, waiting on the curb with the garbage for his dad to pick him up. He internalized this message of his parents' divorce in a way that he said, I'm garbage. The direct arrow came from his parents' divorce. The message he internalized was that he is garbage. This impacted his relationship specifically with women. His mom was the one that sent him to the curb. He actually blamed his mom for the divorce and what was taking place, although it probably was, as we know, much more than just one person's fault. But Tom's nine-year-old little brain did the math. And his reaction 30 years later was that I'm not worthy of love, that he withdrew from love and he withdrew from affection. Tom's behavior in the moment was to not trust women, to not trust relationships. This is how it played out for Tom, but it makes sense when we think about it as a type one error. We understand that his little brain was doing the math and that he needs to run away from those things that he has learned to be scary or hurtful or painful in, in the past. What are your arrows? This is a very aggressive slide and I apologize for that and we won't spend much time on it because we're running short. But it's important that we know our, where our stuff ends and where our clients begins. Our self-care relies on us knowing ourselves and, and working, actively working to, to mitigate the impact of our arrows in our lives. Like 
like any Mel Gibson movie, <laughs> you would know that you get shot with an arrow and that it doesn't just heal. You, you break off that arrow and it probably sits in festers, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it doesn't go away nicely. And what I will say, <clears throat> I've experienced this, and I'm sure many of you, is that I have my own arrow, arrows and they're festering. And when somebody else's stuff rubs up against my stuff, I feel it and I know it and I'm aware of it. And it may change my reaction and my behavior in that moment. It's important, again, for us to be aware of this and to actively work on our self-care pieces around that. Okay, let's go quickly here. Knowing your arrows matter. I'm gonna to point to the book again. This is a great quote out of the book um, on trauma stewardship. And that is one of the most profound influences on trauma stewardship is who we are as individuals. What is our own history of hardship, pain, suffering, and trauma? What resources were available to help us? And what led us to the work we do? The more personal our connection to the work, the greater the gifts that we bring to it. Again, I started with this idea of Ikigai. I, I asked why we're here. My guess is this all is interrelated. Why we're here, uh, well, I believe behavior doesn't happen in a vacuum. We're here, we're here because we chose this. Finally, as an organization and as individuals, this matters. You have a commitment to your youth, you have a commitment to your families, um, you have a commitment to yourself, be a little selfish. This is not optional. You know, being the best version of yourself within your work can inspire change in others. You know, how we lead and how we interface with our colleagues, agencies, uh, you know, all of that's important, but I'm leaving you with homework. I purposely didn't want to give you a list of these are the, to take care of yourself, or here's a book report on this great book purposely wanted to give you something to get you thinking and then to give you homework and ask yourself to go know yourself, go figure it out, do a little digging and find out what works for you. Start by looking in your environment. What are you consuming? What's around you? What does that look like for you personally? Take responsibility of your internal process. Shine a light on it. Ask yourself, why am I leading myself to this conclusion or that conclusion? And if you don't know, work backwards. Ask yourself from behavior on back. Another thing is, is projecting into the world through your behavior something that inspires hope. If I could give you three tips around self-care, it's three H's. Sorry, I shouldn't say three tips, but one tip, it is the three H's. So but here it is. Is your self-care helpful? If it's helpful, that's good. That's great. Um, but that's not the whole puzzle. We all know that uh, many people drown themselves in, in alcoholism. And it's very effective, very effective at push, pushing things away for that moment. It's helpful. But the second H is, is it healthy? So is it helpful? Is it healthy? And the final H is, does it inspire hope? Does it inspire hope in myself? And does it inspire hope in others? Exercise self, self-care, guys. It's important. Um, your batteries are important. Recharge them often. Um, I believe as professionals, we have a duty to this. Um, yeah, and I apologize about um, going a little bit over, but I'll leave you with this quote. This quote is Nelson Mandela's um, famous inaugural speech, but it's actually Marianne Williamson's work. So I'll give her credit. As we let our own light shine and operate at our best, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we liberate ourselves from our fears and, I added, and our traumas, our presence automatically liberates others. I think that's what we're doing here. And I appreciate all the work you all do to help with others. So I will not open this up for questions and comments. Instead, I will turn this over to Amanda. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, wishing now we'd given you a little more time perhaps, but I, I guess we live and we learn as we go through these. 
Um, that was amazing. I'm, I'm seeing lots of comments in the chat, uh, chat excuse me, uh, several that were uh, to me privately that this was exactly what uh, was needed. It was very timely. A few requests to even have you back next March to continue this learning. Um, so uh, for those that didn't get the information, the book Scott was referring to is Trauma Stewardship, an everyday guide to caring for self while caring for others. Um, and Kelly's already got it on her Kindle. So there's an audiobook away because I will need the audiobook too. <laughs> so thank you so much, Scott. Um, I have Scott's contact information if anybody needs to reach out afterward. And then Scott, I'll definitely be in touch to get you on tap for another webinar. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. To keep us on track with our time, um, next we have Dustin Jansen and Chuck Foster. And it looks like they are both online. So you are welcome to turn on your cameras and microphones. And Dustin, do you want me to share your, share your PowerPoint or would you like to share it from your computer? Oh, you can do it if you can. I sure can. Give me just a moment. And, and if I remember right, Dustin, you're going first. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a few minutes um, and go over some of the the legal uh, political aspects of of Indian stuff. And then um, uh, Chuck will take over on on cultural things. But I think uh, we, we need to go over a little both uh, go over both of them a little bit. Um, but yeah, my name's uh, Dustin Jansen. I am uh, the director of the division of or Utah Division of Indian Affairs. And um, I, I also teach um, American Indian Studies at Utah Valley University and currently um, work as a judge for the Confederate Tribes of the Goshi Reservation. I'm, I'm here with uh, my entire office, which includes just two other people, <laughs> um, is uh, James Toledo, and who's our program manager, and Dominique Kalahaftiwa. And so if, if you call our office and you get either one of us, uh, you should be able to get all the information you need from us where we try to share as much as we can with one another. Um, so I'll, I'll just get going. Uh, the, the seals you see here are, they represent the eight tribes uh, that are found in Utah. I, don't, I think of a lot of times we we don't imagine that there are eight tribes in Utah, but I mean, and that seems like a lot, but there are other states that have in, in the twenties, <laughs> they have like 20 tribes in their, in their, in their state. I, I grew up in one, New Mexico and Arizona right next to us had a lot of tribes also. But the tribes in Utah, uh, starting from the South are uh, the Navajo Nation, which is the largest um, reservation in the United States. And then we get the sill, the, the, we see the San Juan Southern Paiute. They don't actually have a land base, but they have offices uh, there on the Navajo Reservation. There's an agreement between the Navajo Reservation and the San Juan Southern Paiute um, about a land, uh, uh, a land donation to San Juan. It's just sitting in Congress, still needs to go through. You go a little further, you have the Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah. And the Paiute Indian tribe of Utah is yeah. located in Cedar City. And you come a little further up north um, and go go east, you have the the Ute tribe that's in Fort Duchesne and on the Uinta and Ore Reservation just outside of Roosevelt. And go all the way up north, you have the northwestern band of Shoshone Nation. Um, they're, they're, they have offices in Brigham City. Uh, they're currently trying to acquire some land in Washakie, Utah. Um, that's in litigation right now. They're not part of the litigation, but there's litigation uh, around the, their ancestral lands that they're trying to recover. And they they're, they put their hat in the ring to try to recover those lands. So we wish them the best. And then if you go west, um, west of Salt Lake, um, towards uh, Tooele, and just... Uh, Southwest of Twill, you have the Skull Valley Band of Goshu. And then even further west, about an hour, um, about an hour south of Wendover, Utah, or Wendover, Nevada, you have the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Goshu Indians. And, you know, these tribes, along with many others, used to, you know, they used to occupy 
this whole state of Utah, what we call state of Utah, and their territories were ginormous. And, and, um, and sometimes we like to acknowledge that we like to acknowledge that, you know, that we are on land that was originally inhabited, you know, I'm in Provo right now. And, you know, at this time of year, the, the Ute tribe would be all camped out along in Provo, you know, all along the shoreline of, you know, of uh, the lake here, because there's fresh water coming from the, the Provo River, and they'd be getting ready to go back into the mountains for the summer. And so we just like to acknowledge that and acknowledge that, you know, the good work that they did in maintaining this area and taking care of it and their continued stewardship over this land. And so I think that's important. I want to just make sure that all these tribes were acknowledged um, right now. And, and you know, I, I said that the Navajo Nation was the largest reservation in the United States, and it is. The second largest reservation in the United States is the Uintan Ore Reservation also. So we got part of the, the, the Navajo Nation, which goes into New Mexico and Arizona and Utah, and all of the Ute Tribes Reservation is in Utah. All right, let's go next slide. Okay, I, I share this a lot. Uh, Wilma Mankiller was the first uh, female president of the Cherokee Nation. She was their vice president for a while and their president got really sick and she, she, was, she transitioned into president and then she ran again on her own and won. And she did a lot of wonderful things, a lot of powerful things as, it, as they pertain to women, but also as they pertain to Native people. Uh, she said something, this isn't a direct quote, this is actually like a really long thing that she said, but in summary, she says, public perception creates public policy. Um, how we see people determines how we treat people, right? If you see people as dangerous, you're probably gonna treat them like they're dangerous. Um, and we can, and I think it's important that she used the word public policy because the public policy is expressed in the laws of our nation and the laws of our state. If you really want to know how people think, what people think about you, look at the laws that affect you directly, and you'll you'll find that out. Um, so I, I hope you know with this presentation and uh, along with um, Chuck's words, um, people will see. Uh, native people in a different way, in a good way, and and treat them in a good way. And so I'll just keep that right there for a second, and let you look at that, and and just really absorb it. Public perception creates public policy, and you know, for some of us, it might take some changes in how we see people to change our behavior towards those people. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I ask people a lot what, uh, what an Indian tribe is. I ask Indian students this because <laughs> I teach at Utah Valley University and I'll say, hey, what's a tribe? And, you know, and if you've never had to think about it, it might be, might be hard to articulate. And so I, I provide a couple definitions about what a tribe is. And one of, the, one of the, the biggest definitions I get from people is that, well, they're, they're, it's a group of indigenous people they, they share a bloodline, right? <laughs> they share lineage. Uh, they, they're related to one another. There's a kinship there. And they have a, a set of cultural and spiritual values that they probably follow. They probably have a common language. They probably have a geographical land base that they, that where they live and, 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 and they probably have some type of institutional authority, some type of political authority, okay? And, and that's what we call an ethno definition. This is really a racial, it, it leans more towards a racial definition of, of what an Indian tribe is. But um, native people, they're, they're just not subject to that racial definition. Let's go to the next slide. They are also subject to a legal definition, okay? So the legal definition of what a tribe is, that contains a lot of what that racial definition carried, but it, there's something a little more to it. So a legal definition of what a tribe is, it's a group of indigenous people recognized by the federal government, meaning the United States, as a sovereign nation. 
And so that's part one. There, there's this recognition by the federal government that you are a political entity. And then on top of that, there's a government to government relationship that exists between this Indian nation and the federal government. Okay. The federal government doesn't work with um, native people as a race, they work with native people as a, a separate government entity. And, and I think that's important to understand because yes, they're native people are racially indigenous to the United States, but if they're part of a, a federally recognized tribe, they are also um, legally Indian, not just racially Indian. And being legally part of an indigenous government uh, provides uh, some, uh, some, some privileges, just as being a part, being a citizen of the United States has certain privileges. Okay, so I always share this. If you're, if, let's say I'm, I'm running around Europe, some European country, I don't know, and, um, and I, someone frames me for a big crime and I do not want to get caught by this European country's uh, law enforcement. And I take off, I run, and I'm trying to seek refuge somewhere. In the movies, where do you normally go? Normally you run to the embassy, right? When, um, when Jason Bourne was being chased by the, by the French or German police, <laughs> you know, that he was going, he walked to the embassy, he flashed his, he flashed his passport. He goes, US citizen, they let him in. And when the foreign law enforcement tried to go in, the Marine Corps steps in and says, no, you can't come in here. Why is he able to do that? Is Jason Bourne able to seek refuge in the US embassy in a foreign country because he's white? No, it has nothing to do with his race. He got into the embassy because he's a citizen of the United States. And that being a citizen of the United States, it doesn't matter what your race is. It's your status, your legal status as a citizen of the United States. And that, and so there's a privilege associated with our citizenship. And Indian people that are enrolled and members of a federally recognized tribe also carry some privileges. Okay. Uh, and those privileges were probably granted normally uh, through a treaty process. process where the United States government says, we recognize you Indian tribe as a government and we're gonna make an agreement together. And this agreement is called a treaty because you don't make treaties with a race of people. You make treaties with another government, right? And so an Indian person, again, I'll say this, can be racially Indian, but they could also be legally Indian, meaning they are, they are members of a federally recognized tribe. All right. So in the United States today, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. Eight of them are in Utah, and there are about 200 tribes that are not federally recognized. Okay. And some may have state recognition, um, but some may just be organized as community groups um, after you know, since, since European contact came, they never established themselves as a federally recognized political entity. There's about five and a half million individual Indians among the 574 federally recognized tribes. And, and you know, so your chances are you, you, you interact with native people. <laughs> There's a lot of them. If you work in government, chances are you are going to work with tribal governments on some level. And when I teach political science at UVU, I let my kids know that, I let my students know, if you plan on working in government, you can plan that at some point in your career, you're going to work with an indigenous nation and a tribe. And I hope you, I can prepare you in a way that gives you a heads up on how to do that correctly. All right, next one. So I, you've probably heard this word being thrown around a lot when it comes to tribes is sovereignty. Um, you, you, when um, government leaders are asked to define tribal sovereignty, it gets really messy and <laughs> you can do a YouTube search on that and watch all of the sovereignty definition fails. <laughs> um, but um, 
I'll just give you a quick thing. But I always show this bundle of sticks, and I, I say this bundle of sticks represents sovereignty. And in this bundle of sticks, these bun each each stick in this bundle um, represents a sovereign power. And you ask yourself, what powers do sovereigns have? And the easiest way I I can explain that is to ask. I usually ask people, what powers, what makes the United States sovereign? What can they do? Okay, uh, and and what sticks are necessary? What sticks aren't? Right? What powers aren't? And so sometimes people will say, well, you have to be financially independent. And then I ask, are is the United States financially independent? <laughs> do we owe money to anybody? <laughs> are we in the clear? Are are we debt free as a, as a nation? Or no, we're not. Uh, you need a some some will say you need a military. But there are countries around the world that don't have militaries. And there's some countries that have a military that aren't allowed to use them outside of their borders. And we still recognize them as sovereigns. Uh, Costa Rica doesn't have a military, but we, we say that they're a sovereign nation. Uh, Japan has a military, but they can't operate outside of Japan since World War II. Uh, but we, we still recognize them as a sovereign. Um, everyone borrows money from each other in this current system. Uh, so it's probably not it's probably not um, financial power that makes you a sovereign, um, but they all help, right? There's there's hundreds of powers that helps solidify the sovereignty of a nation, and losing one does not make you less sovereign or agreeing not to exercise certain sticks or, or agreeing to say, well, I'm going to take the stick out for now, okay? But I still have my bundle. You know, and so sovereignty isn't just one thing, it's many things. And it's, it's uh, are many powers that can be exercised. Next slide, please. All right, so, but in summary, <laughs> I will say this, if you gave this as a, an answer to what sovereignty was, um, it is the right of a nation to govern itself. And, the ability to foster and nurture relationships with neighboring sovereign entities. It's your ability to have relationships with other sovereigns on a government to government level. Okay, that's, that's important. And that's not my calendar, just kidding. <laughs> All right, so uh, the, it's the ability to foster and nurture relationships with other sovereigns and the right of a nation to govern itself. All right, let's go on to the next one. Um, I asked a lot of people, where do tribal governments get their authority? Um, if we look, so to answer that, I usually ask, where does the United States get, it, get its authority to act? And, and most people will correctly say it's, it's rooted in the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution enumerates uh, powers uh, to each branch of government. They say the legislative government can do this, or the legislative branch can do this, the executive branch can do this, and the judicial branch can do this. And in the 10th amendment, it says, and anything not mentioned in here, um, anything not mentioned in here um, that's not set aside for federal, as a federal power is designated to the state and its people. So the, the US Constitution says, this is what the federal government can do, and anything we don't mention, the states can do. But where do tribal governments fit in there? And the reality is they don't. Um, tribal governments, their authority, their sovereign powers uh, pre-exist the US Constitution. And that sounds like a big statement, like a, like a wild statement to make, but we know this is true because when uh, European nations first began landing on the shores of what we call the United States, they entered into treaties with the native people that lived here. And the only way uh, for a, a tribe to go, enter into a treaty with England or France or Spain was for England or France or Spain to recognize them as a political entity, as a government. Because Treaties exist between governments, not between a government and a race of people. It exists between governments. So we, 
all the treaties and agreements made between tribal governments and European nations were absorbed into the United States um, after the American Revolution. The United States accepted those agreements and, and recognized that tribes were in fact political governments that have existed since before uh, colonization and settlement of European nations. So, uh, so it's, they've always had it. And that makes things a little difficult um, in government today when we try to exercise power when the state wants to do things in their state, but they find a reservation located within their state and it, and, and it creates an opportunity for two governments to work together and, and solve some issues. And it works the same way between tribes and the federal government. Now, I believe that's my last slide, is that correct? Yes, okay. So, because we're, we're little short on time. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just, if you wanna, if you have questions, um, uh, if you wanna write them in the chat, I can start addressing those, but I'll, I wanna make sure that uh, Chuck has time to, to share his information. And if I don't get to all of them, um, I think we, we we're setting aside about 20 minutes to, to answer questions, 15 or 20 minutes at the end. So if you wanna start putting questions in the chat, I can start um, answering those, or if you just wanna wait till our, question and answer period that's fine also if you want to make sure to, if you want to pay attention make sure your full attention's on chuck which i totally understand all right so i'll, I'll turn it over to chuck thanks sir hey thanks uh dustin greetings everybody to all those people who are listening um that's a greeting that we do from uh, the navajo nation and the, the greeting from a navajo uh, Utah State Board of Education, What I just said was a greeting that often we give to uh, an audience in the Navajo uh, tradition. We named the clans that we belong to. Um, and uh, the greeting I did this morning was uh, uh, from my maternal side, which is my mother, is the Kia'ani, which is a tower and house clan. And I was born for the uh, uh, Mountain Cove people. That's my dad's side. And my maternal is the Edgewater people. And my maternal is for my grandfather's side is the uh, walk around people. So those are the clans that I come from. So each time that we do introduce ourselves to an audience, those are the clans that we come from. This is a part of the cultural aspects. That's, that's uh, the assignment that was given to me in terms of uh, what I like to give uh, my introduction as. Uh, I also have uh, Renee Medina, who's my assistant at Utah State Board of Education um, she's going to either her or Amanda's going to put on my PowerPoint. And uh, Renee has been uh, an instrument for our office and there's, uh, and there's only two of us. It's her and me. <laughs> so we don't have a very, very large office. Um, this is something that... Uh, a picture here, a diagram. You know, if we would, if we were to uh, look down from space, this is what Utah would look like. And all those little red marks are the reservations that you find in Utah. And as it, Dustin indicated, that the it, it, you know the present time, this is the land at base that we we live on. Um, and uh, before that, uh, this was all red. So, you know, and we have uh, eight tribes in Utah. So you can kind of study that. And like what Scott said, that's going to be part of your homework to learn a little bit more about the reservations and where they're located. Um, just a little bit introduction uh, of uh, who I am. Um, I was born and raised on the Naval Reservation, um, which is uh, in the part uh, of Arizona. And I've been in education for over 40 years, both as a teacher 
and as an administrator. So I have a pretty good idea of what uh, school is like, but you know, in the transition from uh, being a, a classroom teacher to an administrator, principal, you know, there's a little bit more in terms of, uh, uh, if you will, uh, driving the bus instead of being a passenger of the bus. And I presently I serve as the American Indian Education Specialist for the Utah State Board of Education. And uh, Renee is my assistant. Um, so, you know, she, I know that she's out there. You can give a holler if you want, uh, Renee. Now let's go to the second slide. You know, this is uh, uh, an area that oftentimes we have a head on collision with the American Indian way of culture and the dominant society, which is white. And uh, even the name is a little bit more controversial these days for the American Indian, you know, and you have the white, you know, long ago, history wise, uh, we were once uh, referred to as Indian. And as time goes on through the, uh, I guess, years and things begin to change, population changes, the reservations begin to shrink a little bit. You know, we're a little bit more into the uh, area of being controlled by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The name from Indian now has become uh, American Indian. Now, you know, look, you look into the constitution, there's only two places that you find the word American Indian in there. So, um, and this was all uh, American Indian land base. Years go on, time changes. Now we're referred to as Native Americans. Um, and that's probably around the 60s, 70s and 80s and today, we, you know, we use that quite a bit interchangeably. Time goes on. Now we refer to as First Nations, you know, especially up in the North, uh, when, it, when you have the uh, North uh, states uh, uh, along the border of Canada, you find that a lot of the uh, American Indian tribes up there, they, they refer to themselves, themselves to, uh, as uh, First Nations. Time goes on. Now we're referred to as indigenous. So within those years, within the last three, four, five hundred years, you know, our names change quite a bit. Now the question that we ask ourselves now, what do we refer to ourselves as? You know, I feel that uh, we can have an interchangeable thought here, an interchangeable uh, conversation. But you know, in my uh, my uh, way of expressing, I, I, I prefer American Indian, I, and, and we can go off on another conversation on the, on why. Now you get to the other, is, is the white, you know, what do we call the white people? Are they Europeans? You know, are they white? Are they Anglo? You know, again, there you have that question to answer also. What do we call you guys? Do we call you guys, you know, white, do we call you guys Anglos? Do we call you Europeans? Do you, do, you know, you know I, I, I really don't know, but in this sense, uh, through this comparison, I'm gonna to refer to you guys or the, the white people as white. Um, now, we also have uh, some characteristics of the American Indian, which you find on the left-hand side of the column. And uh, the white race you have the, on the right side of the uh, column. Now, not all American Indians exhibit these characteristics anymore. You find that a lot of American Indians now live in the middle of the road. So oftentimes they switch back and forth. I'm gonna give you some examples of this because I've experienced this as well as I've observed this through my uh, association with the school districts as well as with the community and as well as uh, people that I, I, I come across. Uh, we live in an extended family concept, which I just explained a few minutes ago. We live in a clan system and I belong to a clan and Dustin belongs to a clan. And I, I think James and uh, Dominique, they also belong to a clan. 
So those clans will basically identify who we are, where we come from, and basically some information as to who we are. Um, uh, and uh, you get to the other, uh, to the white, you know, I don't know if you guys have any type of setup like that. And for my, for my research, it's just thinking about oneself or thinking about the individual. You know, I, I couldn't find any other research other than uh, that points back to their, to themselves. But see, our relationship is, is very, very deep. And uh, one example of this, you know, for your agency, when you do have a meeting with uh, possibly with uh, children or with students or with uh, families, you ask for a meeting. Within that meeting, sometimes they bring the whole clan. They bring everybody, mom, dad, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, you know, I've, I've experienced this. And sometimes that you have an aunt or an uncle who would, that would stand uh, before uh, the, the parents. Instead of the parents being there, you'll have the aunt or an uncle representing that student. So again, this is a this is extended type of concept that we live in. You know, an example of that was you know being a principal at a school, and there were often times that you know I had to uh, discipline uh, some students, and uh, I'll ask for a, a mom or a dad to come in, and there's two things that happen. Sometimes I have the whole family. Uh, uh, clan come in and they want to listen or at times that I have an aunt or an uncle that come in and you know it's not a parent it's not the mom or or, or or dad so I think that's the that's a cultural difference between the two groups um the second uh sharing you know everything belongs to others is is another uh, extended family concept that uh, is shared uh, as opposed to ownership. Uh, let me give you uh, uh, a few examples here. You know, you get down to the reservation, you find that a few of those homes, they do have a fence around their homes. In some homes, they don't. And uh, the reason why they have fences around their homes is, again, it's going to the other extreme in terms of ownership. This belongs to them. This is their, this is their, their domain and it's either that you guys keep out or I'll keep myself in. So uh, there's, a, there's a difference between the two. Um, oftentimes that on a reservation, you find that the only fence that you find uh, running along the reservation boundaries is the Bureau of Land Management fences. And uh, very seldom that you find that there's a fence around someone's home. Again, that's a concept that they live by, a cultural difference between the two groups. Um, and oftentimes that when we do meet with students, you find that a lot of these students avoid uh, the eye contact. Um, I used to find this quite a bit with my, my students as well as, uh, uh, as being a, a administrator. And oftentimes I used to see this uh, with uh, uh, adults. And you know, there's, I, you know, this is my, this is my, through my research and my rationale is that the reason why they avoid the looking, you know, contact with the eye to avoid that is because they have respect for authority. Um, and oftentimes I see, I used to see this with our students. And I, today, when I walk into a classroom, you know, I go and visit and monitor some of the schools in the area. And I find that some of the American Indian students still hold on to that cultural peace where they avoid to look you in the eye and it, it basically it's because of uh, the respect that they have for you. And one experience I had uh, down in Shiprock, I was a principal at uh, Tebata uh, Middle School in Shiprock, New Mexico. Uh, we just hired a brand new teacher and, and you know, at the beginning of a school, we had those teachers stand out uh, in, in, in front of their classrooms by the door and we see this guy uh, uh, running down the hallway, Johnny. And the teacher says, hey, Johnny, come on back here. We have a rule here. 
and the teacher starts to communication in terms of the rules and how to conduct themselves in a classroom building and how to con conduct themselves in the hallway. And Johnny's not looking that teacher in the eye. And the teacher says to, the, to Johnny, Johnny, look at me when I'm talking to you. Now we had a head on collision with culture there because at home, they're basically the cultural aspect of that uh, characteristic is that they avoid the eye contact. But when they get into school, it's the eye contact. So now Johnny walks away a little confused. So, you know, you, I think if, we're, if we have that understanding as to what culture is for certain groups, specifically for American Indians, uh, you find that this uh, cultural aspect, it really uh, resonates uh, among the communication with them. Now, we also have uh, the next is that unconcerned with time, um, as opposed to structured time oriented. You know, this is a place where uh, I become uh, time oriented. Uh, you know, it started from my father. You know, my, my father, my, my dad was a Navajo co-talker. So him being a Marine, he was very structured and time oriented. He, what he used to say is that uh, if you're five minutes early, you're five minutes late. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with that time structure, I'm concerned with time. I'm, I'm a little cognizant of that, of that structure. But we find that a lot of these kids, uh, they're unconcerned with time. They're more, more concerned about what's going on presently, you know, the present time that's happening right now instead of down the road. So it's, uh, and, and again, this is a, this is a, it's a, it's a cultural aspect that they have. Um, and again, they, they move, uh, they move uh, in the middle of the road. Uh, I'll, uh, and the last uh, on that slide is being humble and cooperative versus competitive. You know, we can go off and talk about that also. Let's go to the next page. Um, you know, you, we, question, we question ourselves in, tar, in terms of uh, cultural identification versus there's no question about cultural identification. And a lot of this falls into appropriation. You know, um, we see this quite a bit during uh, November because that's an American Indian month. You know, everybody wants to dress and have that little conversation with pilgrims. And you have these uh, students, especially the primary grades, you know, they cut themselves out little uh, pieces of paper, look like feathers, and they put it in their uh, bonnet. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. And sometimes it goes into the high schools and on the national stage now. You know, the Washington uh, Redskins at one time they were called, but now they're, they're called Washington. And again, that's the appropriation there. You know, there was no question about cultural identification. No one asked the local tribes whether that is uh, kosher or not. So, and that becomes very, very controversial. And you, you know, we have some instances here in the state of Utah. Uh, the next is that, you know, we honor the, the elders. It's not, it's the elders, it's the old people, the uh, people who have lived uh, years uh, as opposed to those uh, in the youth, you know. Here, I, 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 I gravitate toward the youth because, you know, I, I raise my children and uh, I see my, my grandchildren being raised also. Uh, dancing for uh, religious ex expression, dance for pleasure. And I saw this at the, the school where I was at. I was, I was a principal at Chinle High School in Chinle, Arizona, as well as Riverside, California, where I saw American Indians on a Friday night. Uh, they had uh, a powwow, uh, you know, congratulating all the seniors. And there's a lot of expression given religiously. And the next night, on Saturday night, they come back for the prom, dressed in a com completely different way. And they're dancing for pleasure. So there's a difference between the two groups. Um, the next uh, two little items there is uh, respect uh, other religions. Um, you know, oftentimes that we find that these kids are students who are incarcerated. You know, they're looking for uh, native counseling. Um, I think as uh, individual, we respect that. 
Um, I think I had an incident of uh, this sort about uh, six years ago when I made the uh, tour down in the southern part of uh, Utah in the San Juan School District. There were a couple students that were incarcerated there. And, uh, and as, we, as I communicated uh, with those, those two students, and uh, one of the students really emphasized that they like to have counseling in their traditional ways. You know, um, so, that, you know, we respect that as opposed to, you know, being converted to another religion. You know, we, I used to see this quite a bit on the reservation. And one, uh, you know, this is just a little story here. You know, that one day uh, I got a, this is my second place of my employment as a teacher at Fort Wingate High School in uh, New Mexico. It's a small community and we had about maybe six, 700 students at the high school. There was two elementaries and one high school. And uh, it was a compound where we had teachers. And that one day, you know, my dad came and my mom and uh, I was driving them around the community and we went uh, down this road, one road and there was three churches sitting side by side. And uh, he asked me what those, who, you know, what is, what are these buildings? And I said, well, there are three churches here. And he says, stop, stop right here, son. So I, I pulled over up to the side. Then he looks at that, those three buildings. And he says, you know, I've been baptized in all three churches. And I was kind of confused. And I said, why, why were you uh, baptized in all three churches? He says, one of those three churches should be right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I said, yeah, I, you know, I guess. Uh, yeah, so one of the three has to be right. So, and the last is uh, on that scale is uh, learning through uh, culture versus uh, learning through books. Can you go to the next slide? And one big example of that is go to the next slide. One big example of that is that oftentimes that we have, we have uh, um, animals, we have you know things that crawl and swim, uh, things that uh, uh, are four-legged, and uh, you know those some of the uh, animals, some of the reptiles. They hold sacred to certain Indian tribes. For the Navajo, the frog is one of the areas where uh, we don't dissect. But oftentimes that our schools say that you got to dissect a frog to receive a grade. But again, I think there's a way around that. Uh, you know, the, uh, this is just one small example. We can go off on this conversation also. Because of time, I want to go to the, ne the last slide. The last slide is uh, something that uh, we have uh, with our, our students, with anybody. You know, I listened to uh, Scott's presentation, which I like, because of, oftentimes that, you know, he, he, you know, he has a lot of, uh, I feel worthless, I have no purpose, I cannot do it. See, oftentimes that we find our American Indian students in these four areas. We find that they accepted the culture that they're in. Um, so today we find that a, a lot of these students here are coming off the reservation, living in the urban areas. They accept the culture that they're in. They accept the culture that they are residing. Sometimes they reject the culture. And sometimes that where you find that person rejecting is because they're not, they're not accepted or something happened at school and so on and so forth. The third one is probably the best place to be is to, be, to become bicultural. Um, I learned this early on, uh, becoming bicultural. So I think a lot of these kids, they do that uh, bicultural uh, um, stuff pretty well. And uh, the last is probably the most uh, controversial and most dangerous, I think sometimes, because of their livelihood is that you reject both cultures and they start their own. Um, so it's, uh, it's something that uh, we, uh, as American Indians, we, we, we take this, uh, we take this, the cultural stuff very serious because again, we like to see our, our kids uh, uh, adapt to both cultures. You know, I, I can go back to my children as well as my grandchildren to be a, a bicultural person. So that's my, that's my last slide. And I guess Dustin, I'll follow your lead in terms of uh, if there's any questions or comments or 
or uh yeah um are are there thanks chuck are, are there any questions at all i i saw one question that it discussed um what monies are available for native students that want to attend college and i i did a quick response so there are a number of scholarships private yeah. scholarships that are available but um it really depends on what tribe you go to or you're enrolled yeah. with um, every tribe has different resources available uh there most of them are merit-based you have to they go off grades yeah. and ACT scores, so it, it results in being a pretty competitive process. Um, Navajo Nation, I think they have like 25,000 scholarships a year, yeah. and they have like 75,000 kids applying for it. Yeah. <laughs> so it gets really hard. And yeah. So yeah. my wife's tribe, they didn't offer her tuition money. They did offer her a $400 a month living stipend when she was in college. Yeah. So that covered her rent. They didn't cover her graduate degree. So um, we took loans out to get through law school and her master's program, but <laughs> wow. we'll be paying for that for the rest of our lives. And, um, <laughs> but you know, I, it's going to vary. Um, are, are there any other questions? Just want Just to take invite, yeah, I was going to say, I would invite everybody to come off mute or uh, like Myra had done, pop your question in the chat. I have, a I have a question. I'm just okay. wondering how much blood in someone does it, do they still remain the Indian? Do you know what I mean? How much blood like? So that's, I, I don't, the definition, I don't know how you. Okay. So usually they, they term that as blood quantum. Oh. Um, the, and um, for the federal government, that's different. The federal government, for some reason, put a blood quantum on tribes <laughs> and said, you have to be at least one quarter Indian blood before we recognize you as an individual Indian. Um, for tribes, tribes can, it, they can determine whatever blood quantum they want. Some have a lineage base, if you can just show lineage. Um, Navajo Nation is a quarter. Um, Ute tribe is five eighths, and you have to have two um, both of your parents have to be enrolled. That's a pretty high um, uh, standard, but they leave it up to the tribes uh, to determine that um, really. And it, so it can, it can vary whatever you, whatever it needs. Um, now that's if you want to be legally Indian, right? If you want to be enrolled with your, with your tribal government. Um, otherwise, um, it, blood quantum really doesn't become a factor. It's, it's probably, at least my opinion, it's it's how you live your life. You know, are you are you living Indian? It doesn't really matter, because <laughs> I've I've had friends that that didn't have the blood quantum to meet Navajo Nation enrollment requirements, but they grew up right next to me, right? They they went to the they went to the same ceremonies I went to. They went to the same high school I went to. They they spoke Navajo better than me, and, <laughs> and but they're not eligible for. <laughs> For enrollment, you know, yeah. and, and so are they any less Indian than me? Um, I, I I would say that they aren't, but to be legally, um, every tribe has their own um, blood quantum standard. Yeah. Um, and this um, is just a quick question. Um, I've had some students that we have been trying to get their identification number for them, so that just brings up. So, I'm wondering how does that happen at birth? If the, if the child is born on the reservation, does that happen automatically? Um, is that something they apply for at birth with paperwork? Um, you know, I've, I'm trying to educate myself a little bit to help make that happen. Um, and we were able to, I had to solicit a lot of help um, and we did get that done, but I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about that process and how that happens. Um, most tribes have a, a vital records office or an enrollment office, and your, your parents usually have to fill out uh, paperwork to, to enroll your child. Um, if, if you're, Chuck, as, a, as an educator, can, can you just call and see, and get, is there a process that's set up for that for students? You know that uh, I think a lot of times that because it, these, these are special cases on the reservation where you have a social worker that will do a lot of the legwork for you. You know, they'll provide that uh, uh, application uh, when, they're, that when that person is born. 
application for enrollment, application for social security number, an application for the, their birth certificate. All of that is in kind of an, it is in a one package, but you get off the reservation, you get off the reservation, you're on your own on that in terms of applying for the certificate of Indian blood as well as uh, applying for your social security card. So uh, there's a difference between the two. So if you're, uh, if you're uh, advocating for someone off the reservation, just kind of be aware that uh, that person is uh, uh, an American Indian specifically with a tribe, possibly Navajo, and you apply uh, to the Navajo tribe and there are five agencies on the reservation, depending on where that mother and father are coming from and, uh, and call that agency. And a lot of this is online, but when they ask for documents, it has to be the uh, original and they'll, they'll get that information, they'll send it back to you. Because I've gone through this process with my, uh, my uh, youngest uh, daughter. Uh, you know, she, she married a white, white person and, uh, um, and a child. So I just got all that information together and I took it down to the reservation, they processed all that, it came back and I had a, a certificate of Indian blood uh, for that child. So that's, uh, that, that, that's a good question though. A lot of so people get you, caught up in so, this. Yeah, so you would have to mail the birth certificate, the original birth certificate, if you didn't have access to go to the reservations you know, to, to a recording office or something like that. Yes. That in uh, your social security, because once they're born, oftentimes that, that social security card is uh, you apply for that. So if you attach those two documents, the original, you send it to the agency, they'll record that and they'll send and then that, return uh, the document and they'll, they'll, they'll return the document along with the, the certificate of Indian blood. Okay, great. Thanks. Some tribes offer an ID, a picture ID, and yeah. some tribes don't. Uh, so it might just be a piece of paper. Like most of the time, Navajo Nation just gives you a paper and says certificate of Indian blood. Yeah. Um, some tribes will issue an, an, a picture ID with it. Um, I, I've always felt safer just like I get paranoid just sending off stuff for my passport, <laughs> right? To send off everything, oh crap, I hope I get this back. And um, so even with enrollment, I just, I drive down there and I'm just, I hand yeah. it to them and I sit there. I just, make a day of it <laughs> yeah. yeah it is a little bit a little bit scary to send the original mm -hmm. we were trying to help some students have um access to a medicine man for some ceremonies yeah. regarding the death of their mother mm -hmm. and they had to have that identification number to access um you know those ceremonies and um kind of the sacredness of what was happening and just you know it, it, for some reason only 50 percent of this family had those identifications yeah um and so anyway we jumped through a lot of hoops some of it i think was covid but i i just wondered when covid wasn't happening what really the procedure was so yeah. i appreciate that thanks yeah with, with covid a lot of a lot of offices on for tribal government shut down and so they're only taking like mail in um, applications and so I, I'm like I have one that I'm just waiting I'm waiting for that office to open before I enroll her because <laughs> I'll drive down there and do it that's yeah. just me that's just me personal preference now what if I showed up being a white person <laughs> and I was doing that on behalf of a student um, would that be inappropriate would it be better to find someone to do it I do mean you, are birth parents available no okay then most of the time if you have the the legal paperwork to that authorizes you to do it you know or if they if they if, have or a foster, foster parent yeah, yeah foster the, parent. The, the foster parent would probably be able to do it as long as they had access to documents and the things okay. that they had yeah you know just to add to that uh what i what i had my daughter do was to write a statement and it was authorized by the notary mm-hmm so that you know that made it a little bit more official that i'm not i'm not just coming through there but i was i was there for a purpose you know a written statement plus it was notarized yeah if you get something called a power of attorney 
and it just has your name, that person, your 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 student's name, and and say you're authorized to do yeah. X, Y, and Z really specifically, and have the the student or you know if they're in foster care, they may have a guardian ad litem that's appointed yeah. to them. Uh, you can have somebody sign on behalf of that, and that power of attorney it gives you that authority to do that, and that would yeah. be recognized. Yeah. Thank you for that. There was a couple that um, I'm not sure if it got lost in the chat or maybe it came to me, but there was a question about Native American versus American Indian. Is there a preference with terminology? Or is it like individual? Oh, oh I can answer that. Yeah. You know, oh, okay. Maybe, well, I, you know, comfortably, I, I feel much more comfortable saying American Indian, you know, but I, I have to justify why I say American Indian. For that person, you know, if there's a difference between the two, for me, there's no difference between the two, but you justify why you're calling that person the name, like, you know, some of the, uh, the, the old people on the reservation, they would say Indian, you know, mm -hmm. and you get off the reservation, they would say um, indigenous. And I think it's just preference, but if you, if you express your indigenous uh, term, you justify why, why, why do you call them indigenous? Why you call them first nations or American Indian? In my case, it's, uh, I prefer American Indians. Yeah, I, I would read your audience. <laughs> if you're speaking to a bunch of Navajos, just say Navajo. <laughs> yeah. um, but if you're mixed into a mixed group of, of native people, you know, just let them know at the beginning, if you're, especially if you're presenting, and I do this, and I, you know, I'm, I say this to my classes, I'm going to use American Indian indigenous and native american yeah. interchangeably just to right. get you used to hearing all these terms because yeah. you know depending on who you're speaking with they may use one of these um, yeah. but uh, i i think for in, in law most most legal documents supreme court decisions legislation uh, at least on the federal level uses american indian so when i when i'm working in on the, in the legal aspect of things i'll say american indian otherwise i'll say native native american Indian, American Indian, <laughs> yeah. indigenous. Um, indigenous has, you know, last 10 years probably really taken off. And so you can probably get away with that. Yeah. But personal preference, I agree. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, I think sometimes we get so hung up on knowing the right words that we don't even know how to start a conversation sometimes. So knowing that you can kind of read your audience and, and uh, or even ask, you know, I think will help the mentors. Or just let them know I'm, I'm using these interchangeably. Right. <laughs> yeah, if you're like me, I think that's what applies because I forget, like I start on one and then I get in the middle of another one. <laughs> <laughs> knows, I worked with the equity department for a while, so I'm pretty, I'm privy to some of this, but, and I've watched the yeah. transitions. So that's part of why I was curious about if there was a, a specific preference at this point. So yeah. I have a legal <clears throat> question. Um, I have students that are, um, have been raised out in the white world and they're in foster care and they have no knowledge of their culture as an Indian or anything. And um, adoption has been stalled because the tribe, <clears throat> excuse me, the tribe has been brought in. Um, what is the legal and what is the, I guess, methodology behind that? Okay, so I'm gonna preface this with, I'm not your attorney. No. <laughs> no, no, it's um, just, I just, I am just curious what the procedure is. So uh, if there's, there's a, a federal law that came into place in 1978 called the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, prior to 78, they found that a lot of children, a lot of native children were being adopted out of the tribe. Um, that in conjunction with, uh, you know, women would come in to have babies and and were refused medical treatment unless they pre-signed adoption paperwork. Okay. Oh, um, that and lately in these last uh, about eight years, uh, the evidence of uh, non-consensual sterilization of Native women uh, was taking place at the same time as birth um, oh. was taking place. And so, in '78, the 
the tribes uh, lobbied together and, and made the argument that native children are the tribe's uh, most valuable resource. And recognizing that, uh, they, they, they uh, passed legislation and a bill that was called the Indian Child Welfare Act, which created a, a preference and adoption, a, stag, a, a tiered preference and adoption for native children in certain circumstances. So uh, if, and the, in a private adoption, there's not a whole lot to do with um, um, ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act. And you're not subject a lot to their um, to those regulations. Now I'm going to come back to that, but in a, in a second. But in in situations where children are removed from the home, um, like by government action, whether it be tribal action or state action, if the children are removed from the home and later parental rights are terminated um, in a government action, then, and you want to move for permanency or permanent placement and, and adoption, uh, ICWA requires that you um, notify the tribal government these children are members of. And you offer the tribe a chance to intervene. Uh, and so what ICWA says is the tribe does intervene ICWA says, when uh, in preference for adoption, we want the child to go to a family member. Okay, that's preference. Uh, and it doesn't, and if there's a mixed couple, right, where you have an, a, an Indian parent and a non-Indian parent, that preference goes both ways. It can be the non-Indian or Indian family, but family member first. After that, they want, the, they'd like the child to go to a, a, a member of the tribe after that, if you can't find one, you go to an Indian family anywhere, <laughs> um, or at least there's one Indian parent. And then after that, it goes general to general adoptions things. I've, I've adopted all four of my children and, um, you know, I've, and two, yeah, two of them were, were ICWA adoptions and, um, and I, what we did is we, I just, I just notified the tribe. I said, Hey, I'm working with uh, Navajo nation and, you know, New Mexico foster care and these children I'm fostering to adopt these children. And um, does, and I would, I notified uh, uh, child family services, youth family child services. And I said, would the tribe like to inter intervene? And all that was, was a phone call. You know, they called me and said, Hey, so you're Navajo. Yeah. How about your wife? I said, well, she's, in, she's half Navajo, but she's enrolled. Um, she's also Sue Assiniboine. She's enrolled Sue Assiniboine. Like, okay. Um, and then they, they, we sent them the, the back, background paperwork saying that their, their parents were like in prison or, you know, but they were, their parent rights are terminated and the tribe was like, okay, we're good with this. You know, they had a parenting class, a Navajo parenting class we had to take. And we did that. The problem happens, um, is when you don't, and I'm going to go back to the private adoptions. Okay, so private adoptions, ICWA doesn't normally kick in, but a if you're if a lot of times these adoptions that that cause problems are two high school kids meet meet up at Disneyland one summer, you know, one, one's from Oregon and one's from one's from New Mexico. They met at Disneyland. They messed around. They go home. Girl finds out she's pregnant. Okay. Um, doesn't know a lot about the, the dad, but he ends up, he's Indian, right? She, but she doesn't know. So the parents say, hey, you're too young to have a kid. Let's place the child for adoption. They send her off to grandma's, she has the baby, you know, <laughs> they, they come back. And, um, and then later she happens to go back to Disneyland and runs into the same kid and says, hey, how's it been? How you been? They talk and say, oh, and I, I think I should tell you something. I got pregnant last time we were together. And he's like, really? Where's the child? Oh, he's adopted. And the kid's like, oh, crap. Ah, man, I'm sorry. And then goes home and tells his parents. And then the parents say, I have a grandchild out there. <laughs> you know, and what? where's my grandchild? And that's when all this starts. Um, the, the reality, the, the, the cool thing to do, the, the proper thing to do is if there's an adoption taking place, you notify the tribe. Most of the time, the tribe just wants to make sure 
that the kid, if the kid is eligible for enrollment with the tribe, they want him enrolled. They want to make sure that the adoptive family will not withhold cultural teachings from the child. They want to make sure that there's an open adoption. And I used to be against open adoptions, but um, I'm not anymore. You know, I have, I have open adoptions with all my kids. I'm trying to find parents for two of my kids. Because at some point, my kids are going to ask me questions. Why did this happen? Why was I placed for adoption? And I'm not going to know. But hopefully they have a good enough relationship with their birth parents that they can talk about that later. You know, and I'm all up for that. I think that's the healthiest thing to do. Now there's some, if it, find, if it turns out where this person is just a horrible person and would just make my kid's life horrible, <laughs> we'll make that, that's a judgment call. We probably won't let them, you know, but at least this is who they are. You can talk to them later if, you can, if they're, if you, but know that they're having troubles right now. But that's, if you want to learn more about that, that's the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978. You can get really good summaries online, but when it when it applies and when it doesn't, but um, but that's the reasoning behind uh, that law. I went off too far, but I'm sorry. But anyway, I hope that works. I hope that answered your question. Well, I think so. Um, I appreciate. The time have to go off on the tangent to get the information so it sounds like a bit of an echo now. sorry about that no and it, every case is different with ICWA and and it you know as as and you have to you have to trust the system sometimes okay because um, I have former students that are now working in social services that that work in this case and they're like, man, I know it was the law, but I don't want to follow it right now. <laughs> you know, And I'm like, well, you have to trust that the court's going to do the right thing. It's not, it's not, it's not right on, you know, it's not like, oh, this person is going to be adopted by a bad family just because they're Indian. No, uh, that adoptive family still has to pass certain requirements, still has to meet a level of scrutiny. And, and every court will look at the best interest of the child. Every judge will to make sure that that happens. And you have to, and you have to put your faith in the system sometimes. And you have to hope and that, that, it, that each side is doing their best and both working towards the best interest of that child and, and trust in that. And that's hard to do, especially when you work with kids because you, you're, you bond with them, even as, as teachers, but it, it's, it's important. Well, thank you, Dustin and Chuck. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. Um, and I, I, we've spilled over time a little bit. So I think in the interest of time, um, if you guys have additional questions, you're welcome to email me and I'll forward them on to Dustin and Chuck, or we've got their contact information I can share out if that's what works best. But thank you so much for the presentations today. Um, haven't heard from Dustin before, so that was nice. And, and I'm always happy to hear from Chuck and I always learn something new. Um, so I appreciate that. I hope the mentors did as well. Um, I'll have the recording edited and posted hopefully within the week so that you guys can share this out with some of the other staff who weren't able to participate today. Uh, this was a great session. I'm gonna have to rewatch it to pick up all the pieces and make sure I, I got the information. So. Thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Um, let me pop up the post-training survey slide. Let's see, oh, and thank you. Thank you so much, Dustin. We appreciate you guys joining us. Okay, let's see, I gotta unshare and reshare. One second, there it is. Okay, so now you should be in the post-training survey slide and as usual, I'll go ahead and send this out in a follow-up email to everybody. That way the folks who didn't participate today can get in and take that as well. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon.